over a long time, it seemed like the most interesting problems, more challenging problems were, were, were those that are under artificial intelligence, really building machines that would do more than what we just programmed them to do. I mean, programming is a lot of fun. It's fun to get computers to, to work for you, but you really would like them to be more intelligent and, and uh, perform something that you can just take over. Uh, and uh, that's the challenge. Um, and, and there are lots of practical applications of that, of course, but, but really that was the intellectual challenge that could we do that? Would machines be able to be creative? Would machines be able to solve problems better than we can? Uh, and that that's that's really what uh, what drove me to this path. And I'm, I've been on it for, I don't know, 30 years or so now. Where are we right now and what advancements would you like to see come to fruition in your lifetime as a scientist? Yeah. Um, well, it's been a wonderful journey and we've certainly gotten um, a lot more out of it than imagine but it's it's not in the ways that we expected uh you know back in the 80s or so or 90s i mean i started um with uh, some of the probabilistic ai and then uh, neural networks uh, in particular uh and and then moved on to modeling the brain computational neuroscience and cognitive science um uh, natural language memory uh, decision making so all of this is a part of trying to build intelligent machines and most recently, um, I've gotten interested in evolutionary optimization. Well, it's been a decade or actually since the 90s we've been doing that. Uh, and the reason is that I found that the evolutionary optimization is the most creative of all of these AI approaches, that you have a population uh, and the population is together trying to find solutions to really hard problems. And because you have a population, you can explore more broadly. You can, some of the population members can try very crazy things, things that are very innovative, very novel, and they may not all work, but they may in that doing that discover something that combined with other things might work well. Uh, and, and that's how you can come up with uh, creative solutions that you wouldn't otherwise discover. So uh, in the evolution competition conference, there's even a, every year there's a competition for human competitive results. So results that are better than what humans can do and routinely this approach evolution computation can do that. It can find these solutions that are better than human solutions. Um, so trying to capitalize on that um, is, is what we have tried to do now. And I, I believe in the next uh, five or 10 years, uh, even sooner than that, uh, this is something that can be taken to the real world, that there are several problems where this is useful, you know, it, and, it, and practical problems, various design problems, uh, optimization problems, logistic problems, even even very practical problems like marketing or fraud detection and uh, defenses against attacks, uh, cyber attacks and uh, things of that sort. Um, uh, almost anything that has to do with decision making, healthcare decisions, what, how to treat patients so that the treatments are actually customized uh, to the patient instead of just generic treatments for everybody. You know, discovering what works in those situations is what evolution is good at. And that's, uh, I think that, that the technology is ripe and we will start seeing that in the next few years. What is evolutionary computation? What is evolutionary computation? Yeah, it, it is an abstraction of the optimization that you see in, uh, in nature. And of course, nature doesn't have a goal. Uh, natural evolution does not have a goal. It, it's a mechanism of um, survival and adaptation as a species adapts to changes in the world, uh, changes in weather, perhaps changes in uh, environment, predators, uh, human impact uh, um, most recently. Um, but evolution is a way of um, creating diversity and then selecting those that actually work uh, in the current environment. Um, so what we're trying to do in evolution computation is to abstract that and make that computational. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, what it amounts to is a population-based search so that you have many individuals, many different diverse individuals that all are trying to solve a problem um, and you find which ones are the good ones, the most promising ones. Uh, and you, you keep those, you throw away those that are not so good uh, and then those that are good, you, um, you reproduce, you recombine their representation you mutate them, make small modifications to them, and this way create a new population. Uh, and that is now more focused on uh, those kinds of solutions that seem to work better. So this way you can conduct this parallel search 
it's not just multiple individual parallel searches. They they talk to each other because every every time you recombine uh, two individuals, you're actually creating something that uh, inherits something from the parents. And if parents are good, you're hoping that the offspring will combine the good features of the parents. <laughs> Excuse me. And that way, uh, you can make progress in the search. Uh, so that is roughly evolution computation. One important aspect of it is that you can parallelize it very well because you can have the evaluations in different computers. You can even run multiple parallel searches and occasionally bring them together. So it can take advantage of the available compute. And that's one of the reasons why I believe that um, in the near future, we will see uh, very powerful applications of it because we now do have the compute that we need for doing something like that effectively. Are there surprises found in evolutionary computation? Yeah, oh yes, surprises are, are the bread and butter of, of the whole uh, approach. Uh, they they happen quite quite regularly, and, uh, and that's what you're really looking for, solutions that you don't anticipate. I mean, if you can build it, build it. But if uh, if it's something where you are flummoxed at what to do, uh, evolution computation might find a solution for you. Uh, there's even a, a paper that appeared in Artificial Life a couple of years ago where the community came together and told stories about these surprising solutions that evolution found. It's a really fascinating paper to read. There are very fun, surprising uh, solutions in all kinds of uh, problems, uh, design, game playing, um, various optimization solutions. So one of the fun things that we did, um, and actually really in the real world, was um, um, trying to find good recipes for how to grow plants in computer-controlled environments, like uh, greenhouses that are actually completely con controlled uh, so everything that goes in, how much water, what temperature, how much light, uh, what nutrients, everything can be uh, controlled. Now, it turns out that uh, farmers know a lot about the, their patch of land and how to make it work. But if you can control everything at once, what do you do? We really don't know much about that. Um, we really just biased by what we see in nature. Um, now, we started this process by uh, creating a, about 200 different recipes, different let's just focus on light, like what light um, wavelength and how long you have the light on and how much ultraviolet and so on. Um, and we planted about 200 uh, uh, basil plants uh, and according to different kinds of uh, recipes that were very different. So we're exploring the space because we really didn't know. Um, but we kept the lights on at most 18 hours because, you know, in nature, you don't have, <laughs> you know, full daylight or full darkness. You have a you have night and day. Um, and the evolution very quickly discovered that all these good recipes were near the 18-hour boundary. We, we built a, a, um, a surrogate model out of those 200. Uh, we could model what would happen with new recipes. Uh, and then we tried to evolution to come up with new recipes being evaluated using that prediction. And indeed, it quickly pushed everything to 18 hours. So we said, hey, why not? Let's just open it up. And quickly, uh, all the good solutions were 24-hour daylight. And we indeed, at that point, planted um, some of these uh, basal plants and had the lights on for 24 hours and verified that indeed this was a good solution. And this was a kind of a solution that nobody thought of ahead of time. We had uh, biologists on the team, and they were amazed. Uh, this was not expected. It was something that humans would not have come up with, simply because they have a bias from nature. But evolution doesn't care. It will discover that the longer you keep the lights on, the better they are on, uh, the plants are off. And, and uh, indeed, we discovered something we did not know. It was a big surprise. And in a very real world application, I mean, eventually those are real plants in real greenhouses and, and they grow better. Um, so this is the kind of creativity that you can get from uh, evolutionary optimization, this kind of surprises. Uh, if you give it a search base and there are solutions you don't know, um, it can find them, uh, and it can sometimes surprise you in a very good way. What about neuroevolution? Can you explain the concept? Yes, neuroevolution is evolutionary optimization of neural networks. So you're here actually bringing together two different machine learning technologies. Uh, neural networks usually are uh, trained with large data sets, uh, and that means that you have actually a task where you know what the right answer is. So it might be um, a lot of times it involves human labeling of data. So um, you have an image and you tell that this is a dog and this is a cat and it's a car and so on. So those are the labels. 
And then you train a neural network to approximate that same behavior as, as the humans just uh, supplied. Um, same thing in natural language processing. Um, now, these large language models are trained to just predict the next word. Uh, and that is always there, obviously, but it's still a supervised tra training mechanism in that uh, you are actually um, training the network to produce a known target. Um, so that's all good when you have such data sets uh, and you can train the neural network to imitate that kind of behavior. Uh, but there are many tasks where you do not know what the optimal uh, action is. Just say game playing uh, in playing chess or something go even and and you know many video games for instance robotic control automatic driving um marketing decisions uh stock market you don't know what the right action is what is the best thing to do in each situation we don't know uh and there uh the approach has to be different you have to explore you have to try things out and see how well they work um so here is where you can use evolution instead of using backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent, um, supervised training. They all one and the same. Uh, you have the target and you you uh, modify the neural network so that you reproduce that target. You just make changes to the network using the evolution, uh, mutation, and crossover. Uh, and this way you can discover neural networks that perform a task where there are no targets. Uh, and they perform the task as well as possible uh, we may not know ever what the optimal behavior is, but they will find something that's that's better than you could possibly construct by hand, or better if you better than something where you imitate, say, a human game player or something else. Um, so that that is neuroevolution. You instead of using the standard supervised techniques, you use evolution to construct a neural network. Uh, but there are also now other aspects. For instance, you can take one of these very large deep learning networks and evolve just the structure of it, while you still use the supervised training to actually uh, get the parameters. Uh, so you're actually combining now supervised learning with evolutionary optimization of the design of the network. So you're not evolving the entire network, you're evolving its design, and that matters. And you can also, <clears throat> evolution is very versatile, so you can optimize many other aspects, not just the parameters, not just the weights using gradient descent, but you can optimize the loss function, the activation function. You can optimize what data you use uh, for it. Um, you know, general structure, what modules and and how they put together. Um, so there's a lot more opportunity to come up with better learning machines this way if you apply evolution to the optimization. So all of that is part of neuroevolution, but generally the umbrella is using evolutionary computation to optimize the neural networks or its design. And how do advancements in neuroevolution can contribute to creating more efficiency in scalable AI models? Yeah, uh, yeah, so that is the goal. I mean, actually you can also have many different goals with evolution. You can um, optimize a population uh, to achieve several different objectives, multi-objective optimization. Uh, so one of the very useful things in neuroevolution in particular is that you are, of, of course, optimizing performance. You try to get the best possible neural network, uh, something that performs as accurately as, as possible. But you can also optimize its size. Uh, you know, how much energy goes, goes into running it. Uh, you can also optimize its structure so that it fits a particular hardware architecture, which might be useful if it's on the edge, if it's an IoT device, you know, in your in your um, phone or or fridge or or shoes or whatever it is where you want to put the neural network, uh, where you don't have quite the computational limitation, uh, uh, unlimited computation like we have today in in cloud. Uh, so you can optimize towards that, and and you can also optimize it so that it takes advantage of multiple data sets at once in case you don't have quite enough data to do deep learning otherwise. So so there are opportunities for optimization um, along all of those dimensions. And you can also combine a few of them at once. So you can get the best possible performance with least amount of um, energy usage, for instance. And that's something that hasn't yet been very important, but it will be. I mean, you put these neural networks into cars and, uh, and indeed phones and watches and other everyday devices, uh, energy usage is important. Uh, and, and, and this is a way of, of achieving good performance at the same time as you limiting the resource use. Uh, so uh, I think that it's gonna be very useful, useful in practical applications. Up to now, it's mostly been just to demonstrate how well you can do. 
that there is still money on the table. You can come up with better architectures by optimizing them instead of humans doing it, you let evolution do it and you get better results. Uh, but these practical constraints are something where evolution really is most useful. Humans can be quite erratic, especially when talking about self-driving cars. What challenges do you see in the development and deployment of deep learning models, especially if human psychology is involved? Yes. Uh, so now, um, yeah, so you're talking about deep learning models in general or evolution as well in optimizing because that's that's also something there. Um, getting the cars into difficult situations is something where it's hard to come up with a data set for that, right? You don't want to have the car get into accidents just in order to learn to avoid them. A lot of times you want to have some kind of a simulator uh, and simulators are very good now. I mean, we can we can simulate a lot of very realistic physical situations. Uh, and once you have a simulator, then you can have mechanisms that uh, explore the simulation and, and indeed do get into difficult situations, uh, even, even crashes in order to avoid them. And, and that's where, again, uh, this kind of evolution optimization um, might be useful in that um, in two ways. Uh, I mentioned very early on today, uh, the a, a possibility of building systems that are robust against adversarial attacks. Well, you could evolve those attacks at the same time as you evolve defenses. So you have, hopefully, you can establish an arms race. You know, attacks get better, defenses get better, attacks get better. And this way you can come up with uh, systems that are uh, really strengthened, uh, even before these attacks happen and 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 uh, and people develop them. So something similar uh, could be utilized, for instance, in, uh, in this uh, automated driving domains that you are simulating um, the environments uh, and the environments are constantly presenting more difficult challenges. And you mentioned human psychology. That's, of course, you could try to program in human psychology. That's quite quite a challenge. But you could program in, you could let evolution uh, build other cars and other drivers and control neural networks that are able to control other drivers so that they give you difficult situations. And this way, you can, again, find ways of, of becoming more robust against such situations. Uh, now, that's a really extreme approach, but but uh, you, you see that in, in, say, cyber defense, that's a very useful one. Some kind of an adaptation of that might work in self, self-driving self cars as well. Um, now, it's interesting, and this, but this is a very good question. And uh, it's interesting that, say, large language models work so incredibly well simply by seeing everything that's ever written in the world. You know, it's like all the words that ever are going to be spoken are already spoken, or at least you can interpolate between between uh, la language that already exists. Uh, could you do something similar in, in self-driving cars? I mean, they've driven, I don't know, a million miles or lots of miles already. Uh, have they already seen everything that could possibly happen or almost everything? Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, it's, it's not quite the same kind of a data set as languages. Um, so I believe that other um, ways of dealing and coping with novelty and unexpected situations are still needed in order to make sure that they, they actually function well. So, so this is one of them. You make artificial uh, opponents, artificial drivers, artificial situations in order to, to learn from them. And then you can be very creative. Uh, you can probably create situations that have never really existed, um, well, not exactly even, but, but also like qualitatively different. Um, and and therefore build them, uh, make them more robust. Uh, but but it's also possible that that there are other ways of doing it. Uh, indeed, um, you you could uh, do something that's done already in large language models that you have humans in a loop, and and you actually create situations that that humans might create and bias the search towards those things that actually happen. Uh, you could also build safeguards that are general and take into account many different situations, so you don't have to actually create every single one of them. Um, but uh, but that's that's something that um, is an interesting problem, and we have many different potential ways of dealing with it and coping with it. Um, and and the challenge is making incremental progress, pro small progress. I mean, these problems are so hard that you can't assume that you can solve them at one shot, at one go. So you have to be able to make some progress and then build on it and build on it, and and coming up with that kind of a sequence of gradually better solutions is, is also challenging um, because you're dealing with something that's so critical uh, to get right and get uh, uh, and be safe. 
Good what question. about what about faulty sensors and uh, variability that comes with it and the introduction by the fault of errors in the algorithm? If no other models are involved, how do AI systems can use heuristics? Mm. Yeah, um, well, robustness in general is, uh, is a very important aspect of AI systems uh, and trustworthiness um, and, and many other questions like that that come up. Um, now, and... And we've talked about some solutions already in self-driving cars. Uh, one of those, one of those surprises that I mentioned, like even in that article, there there are several stories about surprising solutions uh, where you have a robot of some kind that um, breaks something. It might be a sensor, it might be a leg, uh, and and no long it can no longer um, um, function the way it was supposed to. So one example was a simulated robot arm. Very early on, this was. I think mid nineties we did that. So so a robot arm uh, tries to get into an object uh, in space like this. So it has to turn around its main axis, like my chair here turns around a vertical axis, and then also put the arm around the object. Now in that simulation, accidentally we broke the motor in the simulated motor uh, of the main axis. So it could not turn like this. Uh, and if it just swings the arm, it's not close enough. So how can it possibly get to the target when it cannot make this turn? Well, we didn't know that we had broken it. So we just ran the simulation and evolution was trying to find a solution. Uh, and we were surprised because it wasn't finding them. It took much longer than usual, uh, but we went away someplace and uh, when we conference and came back and, and indeed after 10 times more compute time or so, it had found a solution. And uh, okay, great, but why did it take so long? Well, we put it on screen and looked at it it wasn't trying to turn around using its main motor. Uh, it actually turned the arm the opposite way, swung it back real hard, and there was enough momentum to turn the robot around without the motor. <laughs> and then it got to the goal that way. So this is an example of how evolution can be creative and discover compensation uh, for these things that might break, like motors, like sensors, uh, mistakes that its algorithm makes. It can recover from them. Uh, and that's precisely why you want to have these simulated worlds and multiple agents that are, that do unexpected things. You you give the system enough flexibility or enough variety so that it can develop solutions that are flexible. Um, so that's that's one aspect of it. Uh, and indeed, these self learning systems can be very good. Uh, and if you have a robot in Mars and it's stuck in a rock, what do you do? Well, in a simulation, you can find a solution you never programmed ahead of time. Uh, but it's possible because it has certain capabilities to find a solution to these unexpected cases. Um, so that's that's one answer. Um, um, let's let's use the creativity and we can solve a lot of those problems. Can you refine it in a way that this specific part you mentioned does not interfere with other important aspects of the AI model? Let's say coming up with anticipated solutions. Yeah. Um, Right. So these are not necessarily theoretically proven solutions. Uh, so as it can also, as it can come up with surprising solutions, there may also be surprising blind spots uh, and you don't know those ahead of time. There's, it's very difficult to guarantee uh, that it never makes a mistake, like I said. So you hope to be able to build a system that is constantly uh, checking what it's doing. It's in a, in a, in a feedback loop. So if it actually makes a mistake, it will also recover from it. Uh, so that's probably the best uh, that we can uh, we can offer, at least at, at this point. Um, so if indeed its solution breaks something, it will notice that and, and come back. And in your self-driving, it's like that too. You might make a, a little too tight a turn, but then you correct it and, and you don't go off the road. Uh, and, and that kind of robustness, I think, in the solutions, constantly checking a constant feedback loop, uh, is much better than ballistic solutions, which is that you launch it once and you hope that it hits the target. I know you want to be con constantly monitoring and constantly uh, repairing uh, what you're doing. And I think those kinds of solutions give us the ability that you refer to. Are there additional challenges and limitations you would like to, to have uh, see and solve? Well, yes, absolutely. So explainability is very important. Uh, since you don't actually know, you don't have the theoretical guarantees, you would want the system at least 
to tell you what it's doing, or if you ask anyway. I mean, that doesn't have to confabulate all the time, but uh, but you like to be able to. So as a as a person who's uh, considering deploying an AI system or is monitoring as it's being deployed, you want to be able to ask questions. Why did you do that? I mean, that looks something that I would not have done. I would like to understand why did the AI do that and, and get an explanation. Um, and ahead of time, for instance, it may come up with um, a policy for trading, a policy for marketing, a policy for human resources. Uh, and, and you would like to be able to uh, change its solutions uh, and see how they would work out. Uh, and again, get an explanation, maybe that way, maybe verbally, why that solution wasn't as good as what the AI uh, suggested. So I, I think that that's a very important aspect and we are getting close to that. I mean, there are mechanisms that at least after the fact can, can explain it. Um, there are AI systems, instead of evolving a neural network, for instance, you can evolve a set of rules. And now the rules are executed and they, cause the behavior to happen. And you can look at what those rules are. Uh, and therefore, they you have an explanation. You could plug in a TPD perhaps and, and have it even verbally explain uh, wh what's going on. And, and that is actually inherent to the behavior. It's not something that you add on top of neural net guessing what the neural net is doing uh, because neural nets are, the information is so distributed. You cannot really ever express it exactly verbally. Uh, but uh, but you could try to explain um, after the fact using the regularities that neural net has. Uh, but that general as aspect of explainability is, is very important. Um, and and we also need to make them uh, flexible so that it's not the case that you um, build it and you deploy it and it will never change again. Uh, the world always changes. You have to have this kind of a constant uh, adaptation uh, ability also in these AI systems that uh, not necessarily that they learn what they uh, from their mistakes that's a very high level concept but but at least you should be able to um, constantly adapt them and train them with new data and, and perhaps uh, collectively collect all the experiences and continue the simulations the world changes I mean depending on the application the weather changes the seasons change people's behavior change what's fashionable changes um, even language changes so so uh, this kind of a constant adaptation instead of a frozen AI model, I think is a is also a very nice uh, goal for the future. And the third one I'd like to bring up is is simply just the cost. I mean, if it takes it's the same amount of energy as 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 a whole an entire city, you know, to train an AI model, we are not really helping the world. We are we are part of the problem of global warming, and we have to have to become more efficient in in energy usage and. Um, and that uh, means really actually solving scientific problems. How do you actually make neural networks work when they are much smaller than that, uh, more lightweight, uh, useless energy? Um, and uh, it hasn't been really the main focus until now, but but it will it will have to be uh, in the future. Um, now, I, I guess I should also add it's part of the explainability, but also the fact that and trustworthiness that that they should be fair when we deploy them. And they should not employ stereotypes. This is a very big thing, and it's been on the press a lot. Uh, but um, and that's really obvious. But the, the what we should solve is is really the explainability and understand and understandability. If we can do that, then we have a chance of solving also the uh, the the bias and um, and uh, fairness problem. Yeah. Do you see the implementability in other industries like healthcare? We mentioned you mentioned agriculture, but about healthcare and efficient energy in all different fields. Oh yes, yeah. so absolutely. They um, healthcare, I think, is a very good domain. Uh, challenges there are often uh, that it's very regulated, and and you also the cost of mistakes is very high. Um, so you have to be very careful. Well, it's like self-driving cars in that sense, but um, the opportunities are tremendous. I mean, medicine is very approximate. I mean, you have a drug that has 70% chance of curing you. Well, that's because a lot of it is because it's not customized. It's not personalized. And if you understand what the patient really is, their genetic makeup even, we might be able to have personalized medicine. Uh, and learning these kinds of personalizations is a great opportunity. Uh, learning uh, you know, and not drugs, but also treatments, optimizing uh, physical therapy, optimizing, uh, say, training, rehabilitation, uh, and, and personalizing it. Uh, how to do that, taking into account the particulars of the, of the patient is, is a very big 
big domain. But everything in healthcare, just making it more efficient, making it more equitable and inclusive, um, all of those are wonderful learning questions. And uh, and the challenge is not so much in learning them. The challenge is to getting the data together and and making sure that uh, we are within all these regulations and 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 also don't make mistakes that are costly. So so it's really the the infrastructure for getting that to work. But but it's a it's a huge domain, absolutely. Um, but but there are many others. Um, you can you can pick up almost any industry, and there are some some kind of problems that are ripe for optimization and and automation that makes them more efficient, um, you know, cheaper, less impact on the environment, uh, and also simply the performance is better. And in many cases, you really want better performance. If you're making medical diagnosis, you want to be as accurate as possible, no matter what. You want to be be good at it. Uh, and and self-driving cars, you never want to make a mistake. You um, And you want to drive economically, so it's, it's comfortable. Um, it's air traffic control, you don't want any mistakes. You want it to be efficient. Um, so, so there's a lot of room for optimization both to avoid these very bad situations, but also making them more efficient and saving. There's a lot to save, you know, uh, money, uh, but also um, resources and, and the environment, which is becoming much, much bigger, bigger now. Uh, and, and that's one, one good, almost in any industry, there's something that you can do to save. Uh, and that's where AI can play a large role. Same that we have uh, chat GPT. Do you think there's still a large gap between actually having uh, an interactive personal assistant where let's say scientists want to test theories, provide data sets, it doesn't work, try this. Kind of more in mm -hmm. the in an interactive way. Uh, well, with a language model, you can certainly do several things already today. I mean, that they are good enough for, for situations where the output needs to sound good and uh, and there's no precise ground truth. I mean, you can create a marketing pitch, for instance, or a little story uh, that's fun to read uh, for a greeting card or something like that. There, you can't really make a bad mistake in that, but but you mentioned something very precise, like science and, you know, it can't do really math very well. It can argue that, you know, one equals two. <laughs> I mean, it can it can it can make very fundamental mistakes because it does not have the sense of accuracy and precision. Uh, so there we have a lot to do, you know, somehow grounded into precision in mathematics. Uh, and now those are two very different worlds. Uh, but it, it one tool does not have to do everything. I mean, ChatGPT and GPT in general and large language models in general are great already for certain applications. And we will probably extend the scope of that. Uh, that it can start to make suggestions uh, and not all of them have to be realizable as, as long as they are inspiring uh, in, in many cases, that's enough. Uh, but you would not, and, I, I'm, and it would be very far in the future when you could ask it a question where you require a precise answer uh, in mathematical terms, for instance. Uh, and it might be another kind of a technique that will build for that or some kind of combination. Um, so yeah, the, the answer is that partially it's already doing that and partially it will be a long time before we can and it might require different technology. So I was mentioning, let's say, high order covariance matrices and like Nobel Prize type uh, mathematics complicated problems and trying to working together in a way, let's say this doesn't work, try this in that in that fashion. Yeah. Yeah, well, there instead evolutionary optimization would have a better chance because it would actually explore. And it would try things that you haven't already immediately tried. So this is this is actually a really fundamental question. What's the difference in creativity that say these large language models have and creativity that evolutionary optimization has? So the large language models, they've seen this huge amount of text and they can um, create everything be, be, um, in, inside of that kind of an area. So they will create stories, they will create suggestions that are within the line of their training, what they've seen. And evolutionary optimization instead, if you said it right, it will create things that you've never seen before beyond what, uh, what exists in examples. It will recombine things so that you get something new. It will mutate things that never, that result in uh, solutions that never existed before. So in that sense, it's a different kind of creativity. Uh, it's like we would never have discovered the 24 hours of light because it wasn't even 
in our thoughts at all. Well, that GPT would, would suggest something within that space where you've seen all the examples before. Um, so those are the two different kinds of creativity. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Maybe it's kind of interpolation and extrapolation, um, exploitation and exploration, or, or maybe some kind of you know, limited creativity and radical creativity. Uh, but they are really fundamentally of different kinds. Um, and both are useful, uh, very useful. Uh, but the kind of um, Nobel Prize winning solutions, um, you probably do need to play in this space more than in, in this space. Uh, you need to have more radical ideas, something that um, that are not easy to discover, that are not similar to existing solutions, uh, that require recombinations of multiple fields, for instance. Uh, and, and that's where if we want to do it automatically and want to have suggestions, it's possibly better to use these kind of creative approaches like evolutionary optimization. But what's missing? I know you mentioned this quite a bit, but specifically what's what's keeping the model from kind of learning in a way that eventually we can come up with something? Uh, well, in a lot of cases, it does work. <laughs> you know? But uh, in order to do even more, uh, one uh, limitation has always been computing power. Um, and that was also the case in deep learning. I mean, in the 90s, the ideas were good, but we just did not have enough. Uh, data, we didn't have enough compute. They started working when we have million times more. And the same is true of evolutionary optimization. And we we um, we are limited by the available compute. And now we are starting to get it. So so these solutions are starting to come out. Um, but, and that's a very easy answer. <laughs> you know, give me more, I can do more. But, but um, conceptually, scientifically, it's also casting the problem the right way that you have to define uh, the search parameters, the search space. What are the elements of a solution? How do you recombine them? Um, and and uh, you know, in, it, it is possible to create a search space that's humongous, that's the size of, many times the size of the universe. Uh, and, you, and it's so large that it's hard to find something. So, so you wanna guide the search towards areas where the solutions are. So that part is actually, uh, re requires human ingenuity and it requires better techniques. Uh, having surrogates so that you can test your uh, cars and and uh, growth recipes uh, computationally before you actually plant them or put them in a in a car. How do you how do you actually do that? Do you actually capture the right elements there? Um, so there's a lot of work in all of those areas of evaluation uh, and uh, representation uh, and search parameters. And actually, that's also where most of the recent progress has been done, uh, understanding what makes search work, what kind of fundamental representations and codings we need to have in order to find solutions that matter. Um, and, and it comes in, this progress comes in small steps. Like I said, you can't get there in one overnight. You have to make incremental progress. Well, incremental means not, not just boring and small changes, but... But um, even though they are radical breakthroughs, you still need multiple of them. Uh, and we are starting to understand that, for instance, rewarding novelty on its own, not just that you're doing better than what came before, but did you have something different from what was before? That's actually really useful when you're trying to solve problems in a creative way. Uh, and now how to constrain such novelty so that it's actually relevant to the task uh, and how to have encodings that would be expressive so that you can actually express a whole range of certain kinds of solutions instead of just one point. Um, those kinds of, and, and even theory of that. Um, and, and that um, they are coming together now. So I think that this is what's, um, what, what is challenging now. And um, I wouldn't say it's holding us back because we are making progress, but those are the most immediate challenges that we do have to solve in order to scale up even further.